Now, before I begin this evening, I, uh, I want to make a little uh, confession with you. Uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, the topic of temptation this evening, and it's a very heavy topic, it's a very deep and dense topic, and part of me was tempted to skip it. But I thought if I'm tempted to skip the topic on temptation, I think that's more of a need to preach it, uh, both to myself and to the congregation. And so continuing through the book of James, one of the reasons we do uh, systematic preaching is that uh, we, we preach through Scripture. And so we can't ignore the difficult bits. We can't get away from them. We preach all that God has said in his word. And we proclaim it and we rejoice in it because all of it is useful. All of it is good for teaching and I think it's really important because we live in a world that is absolutely full of temptations. Wherever we go and whatever we do are people trying to pull us one way, trying to pull us to do this or to say that or to go here. We live in a world that is surrounded by temptation. There's even a... Uh, there's a suite, isn't there, called Cadbury's Temptations. And it's a really apt name because you'll know it is very tempting to buy a big bar of chocolate. But I think that's so apt that wherever we go, there is temptation. And I want you to remember that the book of James is a book for practical Christian living. And so as you go about your lives, as you encounter various uh, temptations and thoughts and desires, isn't it brilliant that the Bible provides a help and an answer to some of the questions that we might have as we seek to live for Jesus? This is not a legalistic book, but in light of who Jesus Christ is, he changes everything. He changes how we view and perceive everything. And the one thing that we will all face, the one thing that every Christian will endure is temptation. It is something we've all experienced. It's something we will all experience in the future. And so the question is, how do we live in a world of temptation? How do we live as Christians in this world where we are pulled this way, that way, and every way? How are we to view the concept of temptation? Well, just as an introduction, I want to answer one question which I'm not going to explicitly cover in my sermon, but it will be a question that people will ask me on the door. So I'm going to cover it now in the introduction and that is the, the question that always gets asked when we consider the concept of temptation is, is temptation a sin? Is it sinful? And some of you, as soon as I mentioned temptation, might have already been thinking of that question. Is it sinful that we are tempted? And the answer is no. No. It's a simple answer, and I quite like simple answers. The answer is no. But, I think it's a no, but. I think what we can say is that it is not sinful to be tempted. I think if it was a sin to be tempted, Adam and Eve would have sinned before they ate of the tree. And that's one of the reasons why we ask that passage and looked at that passage earlier. I think Adam and Eve would have sinned before they sinned if temptation was a sin. However, I do want to make it clear that when we come to temptation, there is an element that we might enjoy it. When we get a tempting thought, we might actually continue to entertain that temptation to develop it. And the desires of our hearts then come out. And we'll look at that later. 
If I can use this as, a, as an example, if you're sitting on a, a bus or a train carriage, you're sitting there, there's nobody else there, and all of a sudden your eye clocks over there, someone's left their wallet behind. And sticking out of the wallet, you can see a bit of money. Now, temptation is there, isn't there? There's no one else there. No one, in there. no one else can see what you would do. The temptation is there. Now, I don't think that that is naturally sinful. I don't think it's wrong for that temptation to be there. But what if you were to sit there staring at it? What if you were to think, there's no one around. I could get away with this. What if you were to sit, start thinking, I wonder how much money's in it. What if you were to start thinking, well, look, look, look how thick that wallet, my, my wallets are very thin because there's nothing in them. But you see this thick wallet and you think, well, the, the, I wonder if they'd miss that money. It looks like they've got a lot. I wonder if. And then you start thinking, I wonder what I would do with that money. If I had all that money there, I wonder what I would spend it on. So you, you haven't physically given in to temptation and stolen the wallet. But at the same time, your mind can still be filled with ungodly and impure thoughts. And I think it's something we need to take note of, that it is deeply unwise for us to say, oh, well, I can't help my temptation, but I'm going to enjoy it and think about it and meditate on it. I think it's a really interesting account in Genesis 3, now what does Eve do when the serpent approaches her? What does she do when he tells her about it? She looks and she sees that it was good for food. I think maybe some of us take that view of, well, temptation isn't sinful, and so I'll just look. And the problem is the temptation builds up and builds up, and it is at, at best, it is unwise to entertain those wrong thoughts, and at worst, we become ensnared in it. I haven't got time to go into this in any more detail, but I think Matthew 5, verse 27 to 28, gives an indication of what, uh, what Jesus' is thinking is when he is addressing uh, lust and adultery. And so, we are to be very careful about temptation, though it is not directly sinful. And all I want to do tonight is be very simple. I want us to look and see how does temptation relate to God and how does temptation relate to man? And so my first point is God. The first thing we read from James chapter 1 in this section is that verse 13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. God. This verse is warning us not to blame God. Again, in Genesis 3 that we read, what does Adam say? Adam says, this woman that you put there, this woman that you gave me. He blames Eve and he also blames God. When we experience and face temptations, it is really important that we remember that God does not send temptation. Let nobody say that he is tempted by God. When you see children and you catch a child doing something, their first reaction is to blame anyone and everyone, isn't it? They'll go, oh, it wasn't me, it was my brother. I've tried that one a lot. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You go, it wasn't me, it was my brother. And then your mum says, oh, but your brother wasn't in the house. And you go, okay, it wasn't him then. It was, let me think, it was my dad. It was him. Oh, no, he wasn't here. What, what about the cat? I'll blame the cat. You see it in children. We have got a desire and a, an inbuilt sinfulness in, it, in us that says we want to blame someone. And the Bible makes it absolutely clear that when you are tempted to do things wrong, and we are all tempted to do things wrong, it is not God who is tempting you. We are to not blame God for the temptation. 
God is not the, the author of temptation. God may allow temptation, but he does not directly send it. The human heart is so good at blaming other people. Verse 13 continues and says, For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. If you didn't think it was very clear before, James makes it absolutely crystal clear. God both cannot be tempted by evil, and God tempts no one. God does not generate or send temptation. And the reason for this is that God is the complete opposite of evil. God cannot be tempted by what repulses him. God cannot be tempted by what he hates. For our God hates evil. We can see already how different we are from our God, can't we? We are so easily tempted because we quite enjoy it. There are some sins we quite enjoy. But God is a pure, holy, perfect, radiant light. He is not evil. In everything he does, our God is good. Perfect. And so he cannot be tempted or tempt. And so what this passage really highlights is God is different from us. He is so vastly different. And I think that one of the biggest amens I think we can ever say as people, isn't it? God is not like us. Whew, good, brilliant. I cannot think of anything worse than a God who is like me. Our God is different unique, holy, and pure. I think the other thing we have to consider, which we sometimes forget about this passage, God cannot be tempted or tempt others. I think the problem is that we can often be tempted, and we think a lot about that. But something we don't often think about when it comes to temptation is we can also lead others into temptation. You see, we are very good at thinking about, oh, I've I've made it, I thought about this, I kept thinking about this, and I've sinned again. I've done what is wrong. But I wonder if we seldom think that actually God tempts no one. But I wonder if we inadvertently, accidentally, sometimes I wonder if if on purpose we can lead other Christians astray. For we are not perfect. Sometimes we can lead uh, non-Christians astray as well. God is not tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. And so we have to be very careful, and I think in our prayers, we have to earnestly pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Let us be able to stand firm, be strong, and resist temptation But also, let us not drag anyone else into temptation. I think we have to be very careful about that. But our God is not like us. I think we can be really thankful for that this evening. We need to be a people that are grateful and thankful that our God is nothing like us. He is far beyond, far removed, far greater And so God never tempts us. Our temptations do not originate from God. But our God does allow temptations. And God, so often, and even through the book of James, he allows temptations and trials. And he uses these trials, doesn't he? We've seen it in verse 2, in verse 3, in verse 4, verse 12. God uses trials to edify us, to grow us in our faith. But when we fall into sin, 
When we actively choose to do what is against God's commands, we cannot blame God. The pure, holy, radiant being. It is not God's fault when we attempt it. And that is God. Pure, holy, perfect. The second thing I want us to think about tonight is, what about us? What about man? What about mankind? What about people? What does this passage tell us about ourselves? So we know about God who is holy and perfect. But what about us? Well, verse 14 says this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The first thing I just want to pull up from this. The first thing we see here is that we are definitely not God because we are tempted. But each person is tempted. All of us experience and all of us must endure and resist the urge to do what God would not have us to do. You might feel that you are the only person in this church who endures temptation. You might feel like the other holy, godly, mature Christians around you would never experience temptation. But the reality is, we do. Each and every one of us will experience temptation. Now, it might be different for some people. Some people might have uh, an aggressive tendency Some people might have a tendency to gossip. The temptation might be different for each person, but the reality is all of us experience temptation. And all of us who know Jesus, who are living for Jesus, who love Jesus, must resist temptation. But you are never, do not think for one moment you are the only person who is tempted. It is a hardship and reality of life. But if temptation does not come from God, where does temptation come from? Well, verse 14 continues. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. I think there are three things really which are a pull to us as Christians. Three things which ultimately are used to to offer temptation before us. And I think these three things can be easily uh, said as being the world, the flesh, and the devil. I think it's those three things that offer temptation. Temptation doesn't come from God, but it does come from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the reality is, as Christians, we believe in a spiritual realm. We believe in a God who is spiritual. And therefore, we believe in what Scripture says about the devil. But I want to address this because there are two problems and two mistakes that people often make. Either... There is a tendency to blame absolutely everything on the devil. Whatever happens, whatever I do, however I say, oh, the devil did it. The devil made me do it. And there's almost a magnification of the devil that makes him stronger than God. So we can either magnify the power of the devil or we can minimize it and make it negligent. Well, maybe he's at work, maybe he isn't. Maybe he's taking a holiday. Do you see how both are quite dangerous concepts? I think as Christians we have to be weary that sometimes we lean to one side or the other. But the reality is we are in a spiritual battle and we will be tempted. And one of the things that might cause this temptation is the devil. In Genesis 3, what is the very first thing that the devil does or says, it is clearly a a tempting. The devil is a tempter. 
And I think we are in, on a dangerous ground when we over-exaggerate his power or minimise his power. We must get a balance right. The second thing that can tempt us is the world. I mean, look around you. There's so many things we could be doing tonight rather than sitting in an old building listening to me rambling on. The world has got so much alluring things. We could dedicate our lives to going after money or wealth or power or fame. We could live for ourselves. You know, I read this book and I think, I I don't like all of this loving each other. It's hard work. I'm going to live for me. And when you look out into the world, it's a bit like Psalm 73, and you see people who are ungodly people living for themselves, not a care for anyone else, but they're happy. They're loaded. They're not giving any money to the church. They're not giving any money to charity. And so they've got a nice, happy life. And as we look around the world, we can be ensnared in temptation, the desires of this world. And then the final thing is ourselves. Temptation comes because of us. We're very good at blaming external things. It's the devil's fault, it's the world's fault, it's somebody else's fault. But those things have only got a hook in us because we have a sinful desire. God cannot be tempted because God is not evil. He shuns what is evil. But we have to admit that none of us are perfect. And we struggle to resist and fight against temptation because we, deep down, can desire it. We can often want what sin brings, and we forget the harm that sin always does. John Owen, a great theologian, puts it this way. He says, temptation darkens the mind. We know what's right and we know what's wrong. We know what God says and we know what God doesn't say. But the problem with temptation, John Owen says, it darkens the mind. It's almost like we lose sight. We lose focus on what God has said. And we know that, don't we? When you think, I know this is wrong, but I think I'm going to do it anyway. There is a darkening of the mind, a clouding of our vision, and and sometimes in temptation, the more we look and think and dwell on it and entertain it, the greater and greater that temptation gets. And the Bible is very clear that we are to flee from it. We are to resist and to flee. But we cannot deny, as as James says, that each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Now those words, lured and intense, uh, lured and enticed, they they almost indicate a, a bit of a trap. If you've ever tried to entice an animal, or lure an animal somewhere. Now, some of your pets will know the word vet. And when you say vet, your pets will scarper, and they'll hide, and you have to try and entice them in and lure them in. That's almost what these words are implying. That we need to remember that if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are not the old man. We are not living for our old self and our old pleasures. We are to resist the luring and the enticing of our own desires. This is what uh, 2 Corinthians says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. We are to be living for Jesus. He is to be our goal, our focus. And then I want to touch upon this very briefly, but it's really important. Verse 15. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. 
And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Our own sinful desire so often leads to sin, which leads to death. One theologian says that this is the true genealogy of sin. This is the family tree of sin. And we need that reminder that, friends, this is so common. Wherever we go and whatever we do, temptations are all around us. They surround us. They are everywhere. And so sometimes... I think we forget the seriousness of sin. That sin leads to death. When sin is fully, fully grown, it brings forth death. So often we say, oh, it's only this. Come on. It's only a little lie. It's only a... I'll just do it once and then it'll be fine. How often in our lives do we downplay the seriousness of sin? Sin is a deeply serious thing. Now, I, I don't believe all, all sins are, are equal. I, I would agree with the, um, the, uh, the, shorter, the shorter and longer catechism that, uh, which says, uh, not all sins are equally heinous in the eyes of God. But what I would say is that each and every sin leads to death. And there is no exception for that. Whether it's a little lie or whether it is blasphemy against a holy God, all sin leads to death. And I think sometimes as Christians we need a wake-up reminder, are we dwelling in sin? Are we living in sin? Or has Christ saved us and redeemed us to something new and something better? Do we need to take our own personal holiness more seriously? Do we need to live for Jesus? Well, it's very deep, isn't it? It's very hard, it's very pressing, it's very personal. Because sin is personal and private and so we've looked at God and we've looked at man, but I've got one final point, and that is the God-man. Because I want to remind you that sin will lead to death. And the chances are each and every one of us will all die. But I want to remind you as we close that James, who is writing this, is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that there is one who has defeated death. There is one who made an end to sin upon the cross. And as you battle with your sin, as you say, I will resist, I will stand firm, as you say, I'm going to live for Christ, and as you struggle to do that, I want you to remember, we are not legalists. If you are really, really good, God is not going to let you into heaven because you've been good. But because of what Jesus Christ, the God-man has done upon that cross, this sin that is deadly and destructive and evil and vile, defeated, wiped clean. And I who have sinned, and I who have fallen and given into temptation, have been set free by the God-man. What a great hope. What a great truth. And some of you might be thinking, does the Bible contradict itself? God cannot be tempted. And yet Jesus was tempted. Has the Bible contradicted itself? Well, unsurprisingly, I want to argue no. For God in his divine nature cannot be tempted. But Jesus Christ, when he took on flesh, when he walked among us, when he lived a life like us, in his human nature was tempted by the devil. And yet, because of his divine nature, was incapable of sinning. But it, that is a really important point because Hebrews 4 
And verse 15 says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Some of you today might be thinking, well, I've got a lot of weakness to sympathize with. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. This God-man Jesus lived a life that we could never live. All the temptations of his day and age, all the temptations that the devil himself appeared and gave him, and yet Christ died without sin. No sin of his own, but on the cross that Jesus Christ went to, my sin was upon his shoulders. The reality is that he died because I have fallen into sin. Because my sinful desires of the flesh have brought forth this sin and death. But we have a Saviour who is a great conqueror. I just want to end by... um, I did want us to sing this song in closing, but, but Phil's told me the song is so old... It's not even in Sankey's. So we couldn't find it. But I want us to listen to this because we should be a triumphant people. We are not people who should be broken and battered down by our failings. Yes, we need to be striving for holiness. Yes, we need to be strong and resist temptation. But friends, has our Jesus not won? Listen to this hymn. I heard an old, old story of how a saviour came from glory. He gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. If you're trusting in Jesus Christ tonight, you have won. You have the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Saviour forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ever I knew him, and all, the, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Sin will lead to death in my life. But I know that the power and might of Jesus Christ will bring life. For my Jesus has defeated death. He's defeated sin. He's defeated the power of hell. And I'm trusting him. Are you? Amen.